du har helt ret. Det er 
So good morning. Some uh, good news, maybe a little bit late for some of you, is that actually we're back live again. Um, some of you who came up here early would see the technicians running around on here, and all of a sudden I said, well, now let's try to plug my computer in, and it was working. They had just rebooted some stuff down in the basement. Um, so now hopefully it will continue to work next week as well. Um, but it did not work yesterday. Another thing is, um, last week for the mid-term evaluation, we discussed uh, peer grading a lot, different elements. Now, for assignment one, you should be able to see how I dealt with your flags. I haven't gotten very far with assignment two, all the flags, but I hope to do that you can say, in the next week. Maybe not all of them, because there's a <coughs> quite a few. Uh, but still, I hope that to be, at least some of you will have um, I cannot say probably half of it I will be done with by next week. Um, so that was just an update. So please go in and check. Those of you who have problems seeing different things in, in peer grade, I got a few emails also looking at it. And those of you who have problems, I had the same problems when I tried to act as you. Um, but it seems that they fixed everything sometime in the middle of this week. So are there anyone who's still having problems seeing things in there? that you expected to see. <laughs> That's good. Uh, because I was a little, I was at some point I was quite worried. And that was actually the reason why I did not start resolving flags, because if it was not working, well, I would rather wait and then do it when I knew that things were working. <coughs> so today we're going for multivariate time series. You can say to some extent, it's just same, same, just different. <laughs> Which I hope you can see some places, other places it becomes a little bit, you can say there is of course some more to it, but a lot of it is very similar to what you have done in the past weeks. So it should not be a huge surprise everywhere, but let's just start recapping what we did last week and say, well, what do we do from there? So we, what we did was to have a system and then we were adding something and then we had an output. That's something, let's call that N1, some noise. And then we had out here, we had an input that we called X. T. That was what we did. Now, one thing I said last week was that for this system, let's call this the transfer function from X. We could write it like this. Now, last week, one thing that we did assume was that there was no feedback from Y to X. So we just have a system where you have an input that could be possibly controlled or at least predicted. And then we had, it went through some system, added some noise, and then we got an output. But in reality, quite often, what you see is that this output here has a transfer function back to the input. with another noise signal, like this. So all of a sudden, you have kind of a closed loop here, where signals are running around, adding noise, adding noise, adding noise, right? That was what we tried to avoid last week. But how do we describe this? 
Well, if we look at yt, what do we have? I prefer to write it's hx of b on xt plus n1 at time t. Likewise, we can write xt as oops, hy of b on yt plus noise level 2. Does that make sense from the drawing above? Good. So this is one way of describing the system. Now, here I kind of write it as a bivariate system. What we want to do to kind of make sing everything similar to what we did in the univariate case is to write this not as two independent equations, but to write it in matrix form. So to have it on matrix form, what is it that we want? Well, we, we will define a state as, let's just call it yt xt. And then we should figure out what to multiply on that to make it equal to something that we do on the noise. In this case, there's no operators on the noise directly, so we'll just write it as a vector of the two noise elements. <coughs> like this. So now, what do we need in this matrix? On the diagonal, we have a yt and an xt here, which gives us a 1 in the diagonal. Just as always when we had these phi of b or, or theta of b, we have a 1 plus some coefficient times something more. Then we have here a coupling from xt. If I move this to the left-hand side, I change the sign of it. So I get for xt, I get a minus, oh, minus h x of b. And likewise, down here, x of t has an influence from y to t through h of b, like this. So now we have it on a similar form just as, as a two-dimensional system, but just as a, on the same structure as what we've seen previously. This is just a slide saying that basically we have these two inputs, we have the two outputs, and then we have four transfer functions from input to output. One, two, three, and four. In this case, two of them are, you can say, quite simple, because they're just the unity operator, and two of them are you can the traditional transfer functions. But I mean, in this kind of a system, what would you want to analyze? Well, you want to look at the behavior of, say, maybe just y, because that's the one you care about. x is just some helper function inside. So if we tr take this and say, what is the transfer from the noise to y. Then it's maybe easiest to look at what we have up here. From the noise signal, you have, of course, to get to y, you have n1 coming directly. And then you have the previous y here goes through hy here, called x2, same thing. And then we add the noise, n2 here, and then we go through this system. So you have a feedback from y and back to y. You could also have looked at just this one here and said xt, I will just insert what it says here in the parentheses up there. It's the same thing. Now, 
what we want to care about is what happens to y. But now we have y on both the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So what we'll do is to make the set transformation of the system that's fairly easy. We'll pretty much just change notation to say it's the set transform. And now we can multiply and add a thing like that. So basically, this is just a simple equation with one unknown that we can solve fairly easily by just taking the y term there, moving it to the left-hand side, and dividing by with whatever is in front of the y there, which becomes 1 minus h1, h2. That operates on n1, and then on n2, we also have the an extra h1 there, relative to what you have on n1 up there. So that's what you get if you just solve that equation for yt. Uh, y offset. And that means that we get the transfer function from n1 to be this and for n2 to be this. That includes the amplification of y, you can say, going through the, the loop repeatedly. If you do this reverse and say rather than looking at why we want to do it the same thing for set and for x. I'll just flip back and forth. The only difference is that it's down here at this in for the solution, or you can look at it there. The transfer function from n1 now has the h2, whereas the transfer function down here has a 1 as opposed to before. Because you can say the system as such is rotational symmetric. It's the only difference is, well, when you have the noise, which one of these two does it go through? So that's the structure that you get if you just look at one of the signals. So if you want to identify this, uh, this process here, as a univariate system, only having the univariate case, well, this is what you're looking at. Well, if you do not know you have two noise signals, you just assume that you have one noise signal, then you will look at, a, at the sum of the two noise signals. But these are linear operators, so it's no problem to add these things and to make a combined model. It will just not be the true underlying model but you can make a model for that. It will probably be complex because you have a multiplication of operators and you will have a sum of some weights up here, but you could do it if you wanted to do it. Here, we prefer not to do it because now we assume that we know that it's a bivariate process. So that's the formulation I have down here. If I take this notation I have down here, which is the top part of the slide, and do the set transform of that, basically what I do is that I do the element-wise set tra transformation of the each of the elements down here. And now, if I want to calculate the transfer functions for y, z, and x, t, what do you do when you have this equation here? What would you do? Consider just linear algebra. Yes? You multiply with the inverse. You pre-multiply with the inverse. Yes. So that's what you want to do. Is that easy to do? I guess so. I mean, a two by two matrix. <laughs> The inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix is basically you take the diagonal, keep that, or take the inverse, and then you have you change signs of the all diagonal elements, and then you multiply by 1 over the determinant of that. So this is what you get. And if you look at it, well, the 1 over 1 minus h1, h2, that's the same factor as we had before. And then we can see that 
to get for Y, we had a 1 and an H1 on the two noise signals. And for X, we have an H2 and a 1 on the two noise signals. So it's the same information as we did right here and on the previous slide. We just did it. And rather than solving two sets of equations, we solved one linear algebra solution. So it's the same thing that we do. We just do it. And when the dimension increases, and if you have computers that can help you do this, it's much nicer to do it once and for all, rather than that to have to go through manually each of the individual signals. But I think it's still, from a conceptual point of view, it's nice to know that it works if you do it one by one. So this is basically just taking, if you multiply this in, then you have the multivariate transfer function. So it's just a matrix of transfer functions. Nothing really new there. Um, so last time we spent quite a bit of time on the so-called box Jenkins methods. And what we looked at was this class of models. I don't know if you recall. What did we do to estimate these models here? You have an input x, and you have some noise. It goes through a system that you want to identify. You have some noise that is added, potentially with some structure, and then you observe the output. So what did we do last week? Do you recall how to identify such a model structure? There's, a, there's one hint up there in the slide. It's not a word, but it's an equation. It was kind of the concept, one of the concepts from last week. Yes? Pre-whitening, exactly. Do you recall what that was doing? Let's do a quick recap. So, what? Yes. <laughs> we'll go over something. Maybe actually I will do like this. What I will do is to pull up a slide from last week. Should appear there when there's enough power. So what we wanted to do first, of course, there is an assumption here, which I did not discuss so much in detail last week because of the time pressure. There's an, it's an assumption that we can describe x as the output of an armor model. Of course, I can create, create signals where that approximation is not so good. But on the other hand, you can also always make a model that is not totally bad. As someone wrote me an email or uh, message, it's like, I cannot find a perfect model, even though I think that someone made something that is almost perfect. Is that so? <laughs> I see, I, I see an almost smile. Okay. <laughs> um, so the idea is first to find a suitable ALA model. Suitable does not mean perfect, but it's the best that you can find. Same thing for assignment tree. To your input series, that is the structure here. Then we assume you have some eta white noise signal here. Now we have this linear operator here. We have this operator. We can apply that on the output as well as on the input x. When we do that, we remove whatever structure in there is an x is being removed because the residuals here is white noise. So the residuals from when we fitted this model and, and get the residuals, we get white noise out. And by applying the same operator 
on both sides, it's just like multiplying on both sides on the, of an equal sign. That's what we do over here. We find this model here. We filter by multiplying by this operator on xt to get something, and then we multiply with the same on yt. And then we get alphas and betas, and now we look at the cross-correlation between the two. There was one thing that after the lecture last week, this is the code that I used as an example last week. I'll, I'll just run the beginning of it just so if we have defined the model now, get the residuals, save the coefficient, and then we plotted the cross correlation between alpha and beta to get what we see down here. I had a discussion with some of you regarding another way of plotting this, because if we take the autocorrelation, now I should try something. Um, So what I did now was to freeze the screen over here, just, just so that this graph is still there. And then if you compare what you look at over here, the structure is somewhat the same, right? If you just look at, so what I did was to columbine the two, the alphas and the betas, so now I have a matrix that I look at the autocorrelation for. What I get on the diagonal here, those are the autocorrelation function for the individual series. Up here I see, well, my model was for x was good. It's white noise. The y still has a little bit of autocorrelation, but much less than it had before. I did not show it here, but it showed last week. And if you look at the off diagonal elements here, then you have the negative lags down here and the positive lags up there. If you stitch those two figures together, then you get what you have over there. Can you see that? Now, one question related to last week. Is this system causal or not causal? Oh, negative lags. Oh, okay. I thought positive would be mean out in the future. Yeah, and here it depends on the order of the x and the y. <laughs> yeah, it's in both directions, so one of them must be in the future. So it, it, it depends on yeah, actually which comes first. Yeah. Here we consider it as x being the input. Um, and but but it's just something that you should play around with at some point to say what does that actually mean. So when you have the impulse response function, if that has something that is significant for a negative lag, and then you should have, and this is essentially setting a wide one through the system, then it is non-causal. Okay, so that was just to show the link between the two different representations here. Now I should be able to do that. That was the example from last week. This is where I want to get back to. So what we required last week was that the epsilon and eta were uncorrelated, as we also had before creating the connection here. Now. What if we start to do it in a multivariate setting to take the same model and we just continue with that model structure? How would that work? Well, it's not so different from what we looked at down here, right? But 
what we want to is not to have these fractions. We want to just have polynomials because a fraction like that will give you potentially an infinite polynomial. And we like to have a finite number of coefficients. So what you would have to do is you have to multiply with delta of b, sigma uh, phi epsilon of b on both sides up here. And likewise down here you have to multiply with phi eta of b so that you get what you have down here. So what does that mean? When you look at this compared to the when you compare these two formulations, consider you want to identify this model structure. What happens to the model structure when you do this? Can you see that? Is it simpler or more complex? Or is it equivalent? I think the true answer is it depends. It depends on how you can estimate the model. But if you can only estimate parameters as in Rima, where you specify the order of each of the polynomials, which is basically what you do, then what you will do is that you will specify the product of those two. So we have a first order system, a first order system here, it becomes a second order system. Likewise, here and there, you will have the order here is higher then because you have to multiply with the AR part of the noise part that is multiplied on the system filter here. And the reverse, the, the autoregressive part on the input here is multiplied on the noise here. Of course, if you can identify the structure and estimate in that structure, everything is fine. But if you just treat it as polynomials, then you have a second order, a second order, and a second order. That's six parameters. What you have up here is a say a one, 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 and one. Then you have four parameters. So you end up, in that simple case, to estimate two parameters more than what you actually needed to. Because you have some products where you say some of the terms are actually the same. So life is not always just so easy. But you can say, hopefully, if some of these denominators are simple, as in just the identity, it doesn't make a difference. It's only when you have these autoregressive parts that the complexity increases. And down here, the complexity is the same. So it's only when you have the combination terms. So in order to get on the same form we had down there, we need to move the term related to x to the left-hand side. That's an easy operation. The next step is to take this and write it on matrix form. That's just a copy. And basically, well, it's just taking x and y to, and keep that outside of the parentheses. And we have a system like this. And a system, a noise signal like this. Thank you. So what does this mean? Now we took the model from last week, which was the univariate model with some input, and we wrote it as a bivariate system. How can we see, when we look at the matrix structure there, that there's no feedback? Yes? So this is for the noise part. So that gives you that there is no cross dependence on the noise signal. But that is also correct. So, that, so this means that the noise input that comes from the two parts are totally independent because there's nothing in the off-diagonal. But of course, in a general setting, multivariate setting, you could have something in the off-diagonal elements. But where can you see that this system has no feedback? Yes, and where can I see that? Uh, from the zero. Exactly, that zero. <laughs> it's the third zero. <laughs> um, exactly. So this zero tells you, well, xt does not depend on yt. And the one thing to, to remember, it's not so clear here. It's much clearer in this case because it's a very simple model here. Of course, each of these polynomials here, 
will have a one as the first ele operator element in that pro polynomial. Just as for the unitary case, we always had it such that if you had, say, phi of beta, it could be one plus, say, phi one beta, and then you could add more. There's always this implicitly, there's always a one in front when you have these polynomials. Just to be aware that you have a one on the diagonal there. Because otherwise you would not have yt and xt directly. You can still have something that is different over there. Here have a b to some power, so it only depends on the previous x's, but it could also depend technically on the current x. Typically, however, you say that it doesn't. Typically, you have such that the, you can say the zero order term in B, when you look at this matrix, is just the identity matrix. Likewise, for the noise, you would typically have that the diagonal element is the identity matrix. But then you can still, then you can allow that the covariance matrix of the epsilon and eta that they have some correlation structure, which we did not allow in this model, but in a more general setting, it is allowed to have that. I think that was pretty much what I wanted to say here. Yes, so here we have non, I mean, non zero correlation. You can pretty much construct that in two ways either by saying that you produce some correlated noise or by including elements in the off-diagonal part here. They can create two different structures. It should be clear from the context what you're doing, uh, but both things are actually possible. Okay, so if we have these multivariate models, multivariate armor models, so we restrain ourselves to the class of armor models, because as we saw, for the univariate case, they have some features that are, they're fi fairly easy to estimate parameters in. It's not as easy when you go to the multivariate case, I should say. One thing that is important to notice is that when you have a multivariate system like this, you're free to transform either of the individual signals by different operations before actually fitting the model. Similar to you have different mean values, that's the easiest thing you could do. You could also be that you actually want to model the logarithm of yt and just xt, or the square root of xt and the logarithm of yt. You can easily do that by pre-transforming the signals and then make a model. So just as you, in a univariate case, you can transform the one signal, then you can transform all the multivariate signals individually. I would say, be careful when you do that, that you think of what makes sense. Say, if you have a lot of different, say, indices from the stock market, you would probably want to transform all, all those that have the same structure or nature by the same transformation. So if you had, say, the prices from multiple areas per square meters, like in the first assignment, if you did that for a lot of different areas, you would probably use the same transformation for all areas. But if you have other predictors that you could use, sort of adding an X down here, that might not need the same transformation. So that's, that's an important thing that you can, you don't have to do the same for all series. Of course, when you have added all things together, then you want to do the same for everything. It can also be that you want to difference some of the series, but not all of the series. When you do so, you should pay a little bit of attention because when you difference a series of say N observations, we have n minus one observations out. 
because uh, you do not have something as a reference, or you can assume a zero somewhere. But then you should keep in track of what is the time that you're actually comparing. Are you looking at, say, the one set, or when you have this one that one set shorter, where do you want to align it? Probably at the latter end. And I think this we have discussed, that we basically just have a matrix of elements, and you have a leading element of unity in the diagonal, and typically you have a set of diagonal elements have a leading term of zero. You could construct signals where that is not the case, but that is from a default ARMA perspective, this is how we want to restrict ourselves to build the model. I don't know if you remember this. I've shown this before. In the very first lecture. Show the bivariate data set here, and we observe it. These are the NO and NO2. Actually, NO2 is the first state, and NO is the second state. We have this model that someone estimated to this data set. I should say, this is not the best model you could probably make if you have the real data. Um, you can make the matrix formulation like this. It's straightforward. You can represent it in many ways. Here I did not have it as a polynomial B, but you can also do that. In this way, these are all identical models, just different representations of that. I just like, what, was that a finger? But it was not just. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the structure that we want to look at. So, what is this model? How would you name this model? What is the order of this model? Someone else. What? Yeah, it's a first order autoregressive model. It's a pure autoregressive model, but it's bivariate because you have two states. You can also call it a vector autoregressive model. We'll get back to more about those. But just to say, to be stationary and invertible, what does that mean when you have an ARMA process like this? Do you recall what did you do for the univariate case to check stationarity? What did you have to do to check if a univariate process was stationary? That is uh, one way to look at the autocorrelation function and see if it decays fast enough. That's when you look at some data. But now, if you want to, if you have a model that is already estimated or given, and you want to state, is this stationary? Yes or no. Then, you, when you look at the decay of autocorrelation function, it's not always a clear yes or a clear no, because you can get close to stationarity. I mean, close to non-stationarity but still technically being stationary. But there is a way where you formally can say if a given model is stationary or not. Uh, yes. So what you look at is the root of phi of set inverse, exactly. And then set should be inside the unit circle. For instance, formulated like this. Um, so that's what you did for the univariate case. And the multivariate case is quite similar to that. The only difference is that 
you don't have a one polynomial in the multivariate case, you have a, a matrix. So in order to say what is the scale or measure of that, what you do is that you calculate the determinant of the matrix. But then it's exactly the same thing. You just use the determinant of the matrix. Now the nice thing is that the determinant of a one by one matrix, well, it's just the element. So actually that convention also works for the univariate case. Now for Invertibility, it is exactly the same. For the univary case, you just have to look at theta of set inverse equal to zero are the roots inside the unit circle. And here, you take the determinant of theta evaluated set inverse, equate that to zero and solve, and find roots inside the unit circle. So it is totally parallel all the way here. Uh, just two seconds. Yeah. So now I just assumed, as I also said earlier on, that I have centered data. What do I mean when I say centered data? Well, here I subtract a mean value once there. It's nice when you have it on the polynomial form here, but if I were to do it, I would have to do it everywhere. I have Y here all of a sudden it becomes irreadable. So what I recommend is that you just remove the mean value structure first, and then you fit a model. Unless you know that, I mean, by the choice of model, there should be no mean value. A REMA, when you estimate parameters with that, it will estimate a mean value by default, unless you did differencing. Then it will not estimate a mean value. You can force it to do so, but that's another story. So the default for Marima depends on which model structure that you picked. So we have this operator polynomial, and we have the same thing here for the, for the AMA model. And I think this is the best place to take a break. So let's resume five minutes to nine. And there were a couple of you who wanted to ask some questions. I think now is the time.